Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first pre-conference workshop for Past Forward 2022 online. I'm Rhonda Sincavage with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and we're happy to have you here for this session, The Journey of Preservation, Exploring the Process of Historic Building Development from Conception to Operation. We have a fabulous lineup of speakers for you today. But before we get started, there are some logistics that I need to go over. Um, first of all, we'd like you to welcome yourselves and introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, secondly, we ask that you abide by our conference code of conduct, which is available to view in a tab on the conference platform and also on our conference landing page at savingplaces.org. Secondly, please know that this session is being recorded and will be available afterwards for viewing. We will have some time at the end of the session for audience Q&A, so we ask that you put any questions for the panelists into the, speak, uh, into the chat for us to address at the end of the session. And lastly, for those of you that are seeking continuing education units, um, for those seeking AIA credits, please fill out the AIA attendee form for this session, which is available on the session landing page. And if you are seeking AICP credits, please self-report for the session. Um, our speakers today are Jonathan Beck, who is the Development Project Manager with Alexander and Company, Heather Buthy, who is Senior Director of Project and Asset Management at the National Trust Community Development Corporation, and Elizabeth Rosen, who is the founder of Rosen Preservation. All of their complete bios are available on the landing page for this session below the streaming link. And with that, I'd like it to turn it over to uh, Jonathan for the first presentation. Take it away. All right, thanks, Rhonda. So, um, so as Rhonda said, I'm Jonathan Beck with your company. Um, we are a development firm uh, that focuses on historic preservation, adaptive reuse, and urban infill throughout the United States. Um, I've been with the firm for over 18 years. The firm, though, has been in existence since the early 1980s. Uh, we've done over 200 buildings. Um, most of those have been historic rehab. And um, we currently are working on projects uh, throughout the United States. We're wrapping up projects right now in Providence, Rhode Island, um, Greensboro, North Carolina. We do, of course, a lot in Wisconsin. Um, but, you know, we have a national reach and uh, we're working willing to work anywhere. Um, in regards to, you know, my position, company, I had first started out at the National Trust Community Investment Corporation nearly 20 years and I saw a number of, of uh, historic rejects uh, being completed throughout the U.S. of all types. So I'm going to touch on some of those types of development from nonprofit to for profit to affordable housing, uh, community centers, theaters, and so forth, to show you steps of projects that, without the federal tax credit, um, would just not be actually feasible. But in my role at the Alexander Company, um, you know, we have to oversee uh, the architects, brokers, marketing, design, acquisition, the construction, and then we We'll hand off the property then to you know the options side. So in the development process, I just went through some things, but in the majority of our projects, we use a number of federal tax incentives. Um, the rehabilitation historic tax credit is most important. Again, the firm started in you know 1982, um, and this is right when the first federal incentives started rolling out. We use the low-income housing tax credit, which pairs very nice with the federal historic credit uh, in doing combined um, utilizing both. The historic and low-income credits in their current form had been um, part of the 1986 Tax Reform Act. 
with some changes given to the uh, historic rehab credit in 2017. We also use the new markets tax credit heavily. Um, I'll touch upon those. Uh, we tend to shy away from qualified conservation contribution, but that's another incentive that, that can be out there uh, for, for preservation. Dates in the history of the rehabilitation tax credit. In 1970s, the first incentives were rolled out as part of the bicentennial, um, just because we wanted to make sure on our 20th anniversary that we were preserving our historic properties. The first federal tax credit for rehab uh, was in 1978. In 1981, we saw a three-tiered credit, the 25%, 20, and 15. And then 1986, um, then was the, um, we most recognize as the 20% credit. The fundamentals of the 20% rehabilitation tax credit are um, that the projects um, are administered through the National Park Service and State Historic Preservation Offices for the design review. The tax aspects are administered by the Internal Revenue Service. Tax credit, so they, again, that's a dollar for dollar reduction in tax liability. And rehabilitation tax credit has really been, you know, one of the most important federal preservation programs. So just wanted to again highlight that. Types of buildings that qualify, and Elizabeth will be covering more of this, but the building needs to be either on the National Register of Historic or be a contributing building within a historic district. Um, at the Alexander Company, um, you know, we work with, with both types of properties, both in districts and individually listed. And then in regards regards to the applications, Elizabeth will also be covering this, but there is, you know, the one part two and part three. The part one may, is make a property is listed correctly. The part two is the description then of the location that, you know, a developer or an owner wants to take on the property. And then the part three is the request for calculation of complete. And to calculate the credit, there's qualified rehabilitation expenditures, and that's the term given to those development costs on which the rehabilitation tax credit can be claimed. So QREs are any amount chargeable to a capital connection with the renovation, restoration, or reconstruction of a qualified rehabilitated building. So it's primarily your hard and soft costs. So acquisition doesn't qualify and new addition doesn't qualify. And then calculating the allowable credit, the credit equal percent of all QREs incurred. Uh, there's a 24 month measuring period um, that's selected, but under phased rehabilitations, you can also select to do a 60 month phased rehabilitation project uh, term for your rehabilitation. Let's see, the benefit though to the developers is the 20% credit on the qualified rehabilitation and investors can pay anywhere between $82. to um, Hopefully that pricing holds um, where we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, tax reform. And so then there's other equity that would get someone, to, you know, with that. But I'm going to stay off of that and look at the National Trust Community Investment Corporation because pricing change, you know, with the economy, generally an investor is looking not only for the tax credit, but also for a sharing cash flow and um, other economics of the deal. And then also, I just want to highlight that there are special rules called the tax exempt use rules um, so that none can take advantage of the federal historic tax credit program. So I'm going to touch on a couple of product types um, where nonprofits are involved. And then I also highlight that the state tax credits are really key as well. Uh, Wisconsin happens to have a, a Wisconsin a state tax credit as to roughly around 35 states. That regularly changes as well, but an additional 20% credit that is tied to the 20% federal tax credit. In the state of Wisconsin, prior to receiving or having and getting the 20% credit, we had a 5% credit. And see about nine to ten historic projects done annually. 
with state credit came along, we would have to see you know roughly around 40 credits. Um, you know, developers and preservationists really have to you know push in order to keep a state credit program so that they can see it's done within the state. This is a, a cover of an import where we would collect the economic data off of each development um, and show you know, what what's the actual you know benefits that roll off of taking buildings that are off the tax roll and putting them back in service. So both construction jobs, permanent jobs, what's the catalytic impact um, that exists? And so we would do these reports for the Legislative Fiscal Bureau um, who would put out then a more formalized for um, the representatives in the, both the Assembly and the Senate. And so that they would fully understand that the program is you know, one of the best programs to revitalize you know, downtown main streets and you know the white elephant projects um, that are in historic areas in you know larger areas, and so it's an investment um, that definitely has a pay time. You know, and so this the national trust you know will regularly produce uh, about the states that are off tax credits, and then also then this this was a nice uh, photo of uh, you know meeting with legislators. There's all at the federal level uh, in 2016 and 2017 um, when we were at risk of losing the federal historic tax credit. So it's it's in front of your representatives um, to show them the projects that you're working on um, and show the impact of the project and what it you know means to your. Community. When the Wisconsin credit came out, um, the first project that we took on was a historic school, and this was a for-profit. Um, School development that both incorporated a uh, historic component and also an adapt well, it's a new construction. But it was a total of 133 it's $23 million project. And so I'm just going to show you, you know, some existing before and what the current pictures look like now. But again, this project was uh, started in 2014 and completed just right at the beginning of 2015. Market rate deal. You'll see that you know we kept the corridors, everything, including you know the trophy cases in the hallways. You know, really units, and um, we um, we then went and took on a project that was in Madison. We had a project in Milwaukee called the Milwaukee Fortress. So it was 132 building, 132 units, 28,000 square feet of commercial space, and an overall. Four million dollar cost. This project um, also um, was market rate and private uh, provided by uh, the National Trust uh, Real Estate Fund that was um, basically NTCIC came in as a partner uh, and used government funds from the National Trust to turn um, on these market rate units. So this is photos of what the completed project looked like. There was nine million in state historic tax credits that were utilized project. Wisconsin currently has now a three and a half million dollars. Project would you know struggle right now to fill the gap in order to get done. So um, early on in the state of Wisconsin program from 2014 to about 2018, we had an uncapped per project uh, credit now. Again, it's uncapped total cost, but a cap parcel of three and a half million. I wanted to then touch on you know the way that nonprofits can you know utilize the uh, federal historic credit. So um, when I was at the National Trust Community Investment, we invested into a community to utilize both new markets and historic tax credit. Um, and when I ended up back in Wisconsin, I ended up with, with um, the Goodman Community Center uh, as the vice president, and we ended up utilizing both the Federal Historic and New Market Solidate, um, a number of community center built into one large historic 
um, redevelopment of a warehouse. The project ended up becoming so successful um, that we took on another historic project um, right across um, the bike path. And so I'm just gonna show um, that with this look like this was the Madison Brooks um, building. And again, uh, uh, the community center did all the 168H election. It was new uh, for the community center. And we combined both the federal historic new markets and the state of Wisconsin historic tax credits. Then in regards to other nonprofit organizations that I've worked with, there's a lot of theaters that end up getting redone with the Federal Historic Credit Program. And most of these theaters are ended up owned by nonprofits. They have a capital campaign component uh, that they reach out to the community. Um, and this is one of the projects that I worked on called the Al Ringling Theater. This is one of the first Palladium theaters in small town Baraboo, Wisconsin, but this is a very Main Street style program or project. As you can see, pretty grand um, theater development, but the this is a smaller tax credit project where only a couple hundred thousand uh, were utilized in, in the credit. So we found an individual um, who was willing to pay at the time um, 85 cents on 63,000 federal historic credits. And then with our Wisconsin historic tax credit, we brought in a privately held insurance company. But the total cost of this redevelopment is half a million. Since then, we've seen theaters in West Bay, Milwaukee, um, and throughout the Midwest, you know, utilize you know, the Federal Historic Program. Um, the Beloit College Powerhouse was another nonprofit that ended up uh, utilizing our, our services as a developer developer on this to both tap into the federal historic, state of historic, and the federal new market credit. This is a $46 million project of a former Alliance power plant. Uh, the project was completed in 2020, um, but this was used as a union and athletic facility uh, for Beloit College, which is right on the Wisconsin-Illinois border. But the power plant was built in sections phases over the years. So I'm just going to kind of sh show you some of the before and that even on power plants, uh, the, the Wisconsin federal credit, that, you know, in order to uh, see a project like this undertaken. And then wanted to touch upon, you know, utilizing historic credits with uh, the low income housing credits. I'm going to show you number of projects. We, we do a lot of work with the uh, General Service Administration, federal agencies that are looking to dispose of, um, you know, their properties if they're not in use anymore. A project called the Courthouse Loss in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, there was a new federal courthouse that was built down the block. This building was left vacant. Started discussions with the federal government on, you know, purchasing it through the G and uh, we repurposed this. Read uh, during the recession of 2000 to 2010. So, but it was a $40 million project. Um, we utilized date historic income credits um, in Missouri and redeveloped this uh, while even, you know, resort, preserve the historic corridors, uh, um, courtrooms, and then a number of law firms that are using some of the lobby as commercial space but some other projects that we did were a large master use developments um, this is another project that is called Park seminary this was um, part of a girls school and um, it was taken over by the army under the uh, war powers act in 1942 and then left vacant uh, after uh, world war actually the vietnam this was an RFP process that the company was selected, element where we did 66 apartments, the historic condominium, 
was a historic room um, and 90 new townhomes. This is some of the condition and what land looked like. And this led us to do some master developing work uh, on a project uh, that was a formal former penitentiary for Washington, D.C., where we did 171 apartments, 151 homes, 24 single family homes, um, retail, office, for a total of $190 million. Um, but again, you know, really unique apartments and uh, mixed use that could not have been done with the uh, Virginia State Credit and the Federal Historic Credit. And then this is just going to lead to my last project that I wanted to mention was the uh, Milwaukee Soldier Home. With all these different nonprofits and you know government entities, uh, we ended up responding uh, to an RF from the Department of Veterans Affairs to restore six buildings on this historic landmark. Um, this was one of the uh, acts signed by Lincoln was creating a system of care for veterans in the Civil War. And an entire campus ended up being built in Milwaukee starting in 1867 after funds were raised um, in Milwaukee um, to you know, care for veterans. And Milwaukee sent their uh, dollars into the, to the federal government and they were selected for first sites. So this is now a VAMC veteran medical campus. And, but the buildings were left vacant for the past 30 years. So um, while the federal government owned these, um, you know, they were focusing on traumatic brain injury and PTSD. And so um, the preservation community had to really, you know, push to get a request for qualification RFP out uh, to select the developer in order to turn these for housing uh, for veterans at risk of homelessness. But some of the these are some of the photos of what this campus looked like back in the, the day, and you know there's a theater on the campus, there's a chapel, uh, numerous buildings, um, and up preserving six of them and only 101 units of housing. Other buildings coming up shortly, you know, in the next year um, to be redeveloped, including this chapel and that theater. And we had 80 building, sorry, 101 units of housing, 80 units in the first main building for a total development of 44 and a half million. There's about 13 layers of financing, but we used both the federal loan income housing at the 9% and the non competitive federal housing tax credit of 4%, federal historic equity of nearly 7 million, state of Wisconsin historic tax credit equity of 5 and when Logic was going through tax reform, it up um, the pricing for the credits dropped when we went from a 35% corporate tax rate to 21%. They, given that we had lined up the other sources of financing, um, they ended up contributing uh, $5 million of military construction funding. We partnered with the Housing Authority of the City of Milwaukee, um, where we're 50-50 partners with their tax credit investor. And we have a 75-year enhanced lease with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, this is a you know very high-profile project. You know, covered the New York Times and people, and a number of tax credit trade journals. Um, given how we put together this financing on the project, and also interesting, we used the, from the Historic American Building Survey uh, when the project was really you know all kind of buried up. And you couldn't get into it. Historic American Building Survey, a program administered by Library from the Department of Interior, uh, we got very long as an AutoCAD um, in order to kind of figure out how that layout of the building would work before we even responded to the RFP. This project has received very strong bipartisan support of the state, but we uh, started construction right prior to the pandemic and September 18, worked through the pandemic and the first unit opened in March of 2001. Currently 100% leased on this. 
and uh, enjoy some of the completed photos. But project that involves nonprofits, uh, federal and state historic credits, public housing credits, and is you know taking a building that was originally constructed to support veterans and its continued day. So I kind of like you know projects like that, um, it's being used you know for its intended purposes. Is one of the women's wings. And then you have these beautiful um, and then the slate roofs that we had to go to Vermont to match the original slate. Again, this is a National Historic Landmark, so we had to go through the State Historic Preservation Office, then the, the Park Service, and then the National Historic Landmark Division of the National Park Service in order to complete this project. These are some of the single family homes and duplexes that used to be all quarters that are now three and four bedrooms. And again, um, just a really complicated project, but up winning the Richard Driehaus uh, Navigation Award, as well as the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation Award for Excellence in Historic Preservation. But those are just some of the Types of projects can do that um, would not be anywhere of reality or possibility without the federal and state programs um, that I touched upon. That's it for my section. Thank you. Great. Thank you, John. It's so good to see pictures of those uh, historic buildings sort of brought back to life and put to good use. Thank you. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the basics of the historic tax credit, which as John said, uh, is vital for a lot of the uh, the rehab work that, that's being done to these buildings, as well as some of the things, uh, sort of how, how the projects uh, monetize the historic tax credits and what the investors in the historic tax credits are looking for. Next slide. So, I work at the National Trust for Community Investment Corporation. Uh, we are a, a, the uh, for-profit arm of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And so we have a number of hats that we wear, uh, but we are a mission-based organization uh, to support the country's architectural heritage, community development, and we also have renewable energy uh, initiatives, uh, all doing all that really through federal and state tax credits. Uh, so one of our primary roles is uh, syndication services. We really try to match up projects with investors so that projects can get funds uh, that they that they need to finish up their capital stacks and invest or, and complete their projects. We also provide technical assistance and asset management and compliance. Uh, we've been around for 22 years now, uh, really know the ins and outs of the credits and the requirements. Uh, so we have a lot of expertise to offer on that front. And then uh, we are uh, have a very uh, great public policy and advocacy team. Uh, we work uh, with the Historic Tax Credit Coalition to make sure that we're advocating for uh, improvements or uh, survival of uh, federal historic tax credit uh, in particular. Next slide. So as I said, we've been around for 22 years uh, and have done a lot of good uh, over those, those 22 years, both on the historic and community development fronts. Uh, we've done 187 investments, uh, almost $2 billion uh, into projects uh, and from small main street projects to, um, you know, large 10, 16, 18 building campuses. So all over the place uh, as far as types of projects and types uh, and asset types. Uh, uh, John mentioned theaters and housing uh, and community centers. Uh, we do them all. Uh, and one of the good things to, to notice here is, you know, not only are we bringing these uh, historic buildings back to life, but they're creating construction jobs and permanent jobs and uh, bringing uh, services to communities uh, that need them. Shift to the next slide. And you can go to the next one as well. Uh, John mentioned uh, as he was showing some of the projects, some, you know, the 
laundry list of financing tools that are used in these capital stacks. Obviously, there's equity that sponsors bring. There's loans that they uh, that they source uh, from typical uh, market rate lenders to uh, you know HUD loans to USDA loans. There's all kinds of different programs that are available there. There's bonds and there's grants and there's tax abatement. But as you can see at the top of the list, and as John mentioned, a lot of times tax credits are what uh, really finish up the capital stack. So we can go to the next slide and you can see, although we focus primarily on historic tax credits, um, as John mentioned, I, there's uh, low income housing tax credits, there's new market tax credits, and all of these tax credits uh, can generally play together. So if you've got a historic building that's in a low income community, you can pair uh, historics and new markets uh, to get some extra benefit uh, and extra sources for your project. Uh, and then as John mentioned, there's also uh, LIHTC can be included in the capital stack. So if you're doing a housing project that's uh, eligible for low income housing tax credits, uh, there's just a variety of ways to uh, enhance your capital stack as you're trying to, to build the budget for your project. Let me go to the next slide. So on the HTC in particular, as John mentioned, it's the 20% credit. Uh, nowadays, it's earned 4% per year over five years. I think there may be a few remaining projects that are eligible for the grandfathered uh, credit. Uh, before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the credit was actually all earned in one year. Uh, so now it's been shifted to 4% uh, over five years. And it's important to note that it's generated when the building is actually completed and ready to be used for its intended use. So it's very important to investors that uh, we can see a completed capital stack and the ability of the of the sponsor to get the building completed and um, ready for use. It does have a five year compliance period. So this is the period in which the credits are subject to recapture. So obviously that's something that investors are uh, paying attention to because once they get the credits, they want to be able to book them and not uh, have to go back and amend tax uh, tax returns and, and lose the credits. Um, so to avoid that, uh, we want to make sure that there's no material alterations to the building, uh, that the what you told the National Park Service you would do actually gets done and stays that way for five years. Uh, and then there's also a restriction on transferring ownership of the, the building uh, to make sure that it stays in the same hands for, for the compliance period. The good thing on the historic tax credit front is that as each year passes, there's uh, what we call a 20% burn off. So uh, it's not 100% recapture for the entire five years. Uh, it burns off 20% each year. One of the other important things about the tax credit is um, that it cannot be freely bought and sold, have to be uh, have to hold a profits interest uh, in the partnership in order to be eligible to receive the credits and have those allocated to you. And you have to be, uh, for the investor, has to be uh, in the partnership prior to the time the building is completed and placed in service. So obviously timing is important uh, when you're considering doing a development. Uh, make sure that you identify your investors and get them in there before uh, the building has been placed in service so that you can take advantage of the equity that comes along with the historic tax credits. And you can go to the next slide. Uh, so there's four tests that you have to meet uh, to qualify for the 20% historic tax credit. Uh, one, is, one is John mentioned, it has to be a certified historic building, which means it can either be listed on the national register or it could be a contributing building uh, to a historic district. Uh, it must also be a certified Rehabilitation, which I know Elizabeth will touch on, um, but it means that the rehab that you do has to uh, adhere to the secretary's standards for historic rehabilitation. Uh, it has to be an income producing uh, asset. So like we talked about, lots of different asset classes, apartments, hotels, uh, office, retail, theaters, uh, but owner occupied residents don't qualify. And then as John briefly mentioned, there is also a substantial rehabilitation requirement. So you have to do, uh, have to meet a test on it for a minimum amount of work that's done on the project in order to be eligible for the, for the credit. And you can click to the next slide. And so 
because I'm here talking about investors, it's, uh, obviously there are um, there are parties that are interested in these credits that are not just the sponsors. Uh, and some of the accounting rules uh, are a little bit intense, but in general, uh, it's important to know for the investors that you can carry it back one year and carry credit, the credit forward 20 years. So there's some flexibility in how to apply the credit. Generally, the investors that we work are with are C-Corps, large um, or regional banks, insurance companies, and other corporations that have some federal tax appetite. In some cases, uh, there are you know, sponsors that qualify as real estate professionals or um, have, uh, have some passive income um, that falls below a particular threshold that allows them to use it. But in general, uh, they're difficult to use sometimes for uh, individuals. So you'll see um, larger companies with federal tax appetite uh, come in and, and be willing to pay for those credits. Go ahead, shift to the next one. And so you heard John mention uh, qualified rehabilitation expenditures. Uh, we call them QREs. So you take those QREs and multiply by 20%. And as I mentioned, if building owners can't use the credits, they need a third party investor, um, which is where we come in and try to match you up with a, your project up with an investor. And there, the pricing is, as John mentioned, sort of uh, tends to vary. It's generally less than a dollar a credit in order for them to actually realize the benefit of the credit. And it depends on whether it's a one year or five year credit, uh, how many credits are available, what the size of the project is. And then various factors like, you know, what is the asset type? Where is it? Uh, are there community impacts that um, that make it um, attractive? And then when you figure out the credits and you figure out the investor pricing, that is uh, results in the HTC equity. Uh, and that's the amount that the investor will put into the project to uh, enhance your capital stack. Let me shift to the next slide. And so, as John mentioned, there's typical, typically uh, some other things that the investor is looking for. Uh, so one of those things is that not only do they look for credits, but they also look for um, what, what we call a uh, priority return or some cash to come out of the deal as well. That's generally in the 2% the range. Uh, so they're looking for cash uh, and credits. And then... We also need to just make sure that the money actually comes in um, over time on a pay-in schedule. So you'll typically get 25 to 30% at closing, and then the remainder will come in uh, over time. Typically uh, another big uh, tranche after the building is completed. And then once the part three is received and then uh, a small piece for stabilization. And the reason for that is because obviously the credits will be available once place and service occurs, but since there's usually a cash component of it, the best investor wants to see that the building is uh, doing well uh, and performing. Um, there's also at the back end, uh, we talked about the five-year compliance period. So uh, once that compliance period ends, there's usually a put option where the investor has the um, option to get out of the deal. Uh, and the price for that is usually 5% of equity. So we can switch to the next slide and actually go to the next one. We'll talk a little bit about structures because obviously when you uh, involve an investor, uh, you've got to figure out a way to insert them into the ownership structure so that they can be allocated the credits. And it all starts with the HTC landlord, who's usually an affiliate of the sponsor uh, and the entity that owns the building and secures the financing and works with the general contractor and the architect and a historic consultant uh, and actually does the rehabilitation. So we start there and then we move to the next slide. And you start layering on uh, some of the uh, sources of funds. So obviously this is where the HTC landlord is the, the level that uh, where the loans will come in uh, and then the member equity will come in. And then if you go to the next slide, you'll see our federal investors. So as we talked about, they have tax credit, tax credit appetite, they have capital, they want HTC's uh, 
to offset their federal income tax liability as well as cash flow. And so there's two primary structures uh, to sort of insert the investor into uh, the existing uh, structure. So you can go to the next one. The one that we see most often is uh, what we call the HTC lease or pass-through structure. Uh, the IRS permits the tax credits to be passed through to a, a tenant, uh, which here we call it the HTC tenant. So the HTC tenant is set up uh, so the investor owns 99% of that and 1% is owned by the another sponsor affiliate. Uh, and that way the tax credits can be, 99% uh, of them can be provided to the investor. Uh, and then the HTC tenant will be the, the landlord for any residential or commercial tenants, they'll receive uh, rent and then they'll pay rent over to the landlord uh, through the HTC lease. This allows uh, the HTC landlord level to keep some of the depreciation uh, and just uh, sort of separates the HTC transaction from the where the, the lender and some of the other uh, capital is located. We'll go to the next slide. The other option is to actually have the federal investor uh, invest directly into the HTC landlord. Sometimes uh, this is a little bit more difficult because uh, as part of the uh, IRS requirements, the investor has to have a 99% interest in the landlord uh, to get 99% of the credits. So that is typically a big percentage that uh, the uh, investor doesn't usually, or that the project is um, sometimes has a hard time sort of giving up that much in their in their HTC landlord. Uh, but in this situation, then the HTC landlord is the landlord for the residential and commercial tenants. Uh, the other difference between the two, as we'll as we'll see uh, in some future slides, is a lot of times the investor would like to see some restrictions on the um, remedies of the lender. Those are a little bit easier to do in the pass-through structure. Uh, we call it an unconditional SNDA so that the lender can foreclose on uh, the property but has to keep the master lease in place. Uh, whereas if you have this uh, direct investment structure, uh, you would need to ask the lender to actually forbear from exercising any remedies at all. And so sometimes the, the lender remedies are, are one of the things that to consider uh, when you're trying to decide what structure you're going to use. You can go on to the next slide. There you go. So one of the things, uh, obviously, we've seen a number of deals uh, and just wanted to share a little bit about uh, what investors are looking for when they're looking at at projects. Uh, we talked a little bit about using HTCs with new markets and we call those twinning. Um, we have done investments in 35 different states. And as John mentioned, a lot of times uh, the states that we uh, the states that we uh, invest in also have a state historic credit because obviously that helps with the capital stack. Um, so like I mentioned, we a range of investment sizes from less than a million to over 20 million um, and a range of asset classes. Uh, and so in working with the investors uh, on a, these types of projects, we've found uh, some commonalities as we look at what investors are looking for. So you can click to the next slide. So one of the big things we look for is project readiness. As I mentioned, one of the, the key components of being able to take the credit are uh, is getting to completion. And so investors want to know that the construction and design drawings are done, um, that the part one and two are complete, uh, and the NPS has signed off on the design, that the construction budget is in place, that the due diligence been, has been done, uh, that the financing has term sheets that are uh, and is ready to go, uh, and then on the operation side, uh, want to make sure that uh, we understand what the use is and that if it is uh, has any sort of commercial aspect or uh, retail aspect that there is there are at least some leases in place that it's not completely uh, spec. 
And then a lot of this will be shown uh, the terms of the financing, the terms of the HTC equity, the um, the operations assumptions, those will all be shown in a pro forma or projection. So those numbers are very important for an investor uh, to see and um, when they're considering a project. You can go on to the next slide. So some of the risks that uh, an investor is keyed in on, obviously structuring, uh, we want to make sure that it's structured uh, appropriately uh, to avoid loss of historic tax credits, you know, that there's not, there, that the, there's not a 99-1 breakout so that the investor can get 99% of the tax credits and that uh, we're making sure to address any nonprofit issues, uh, ownership issues, that kind of thing. So those are things uh, that the investor is, uh, that are important to the investor and one of the reasons yeah. why uh, we want to make sure that there is uh, tax credit counsel involved uh, and accountants involved that are very familiar with the rules. Uh, construction completion is very important. Uh, like I said, credit delivery is contingent upon place and service. So uh, we want to make sure that there are uh, sufficient uh, sources to get the, the deal done or the project completed. As far as credit delivery, uh, Obviously, we need the project to be done in accordance with MPS requirements. Uh, and normally, when you underwrite the projects from an investor perspective, they price it uh, based on their appetite for credits in a given year. So anytime that place and service is delayed or that QRE amounts change, obviously that impacts the investor return. So we want to make sure to take a look at that and uh, see that that's solid. Operations are another area that we make sure to look at. Uh, as we mentioned, not only the credits are important to an investor, but typically uh, there is some interest in uh, the success of the project and um, seeing it generate some cash flow, obviously to um, cover debt service and make sure there's no issues with the lender, but also provide a small return to the investor. And then as we talked about, we want to avoid recapture uh, during the compliance period. Uh, so we want to ensure that there's no change in ownership, no material alteration of the building. Um, and then obviously no one wants to see um, anything bad happened to it from a casualty perspective. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, so some of the mitigants that are that are put in place uh, here, obviously having an experienced team on all fronts uh, really helps uh, with the underwriting and, and the comfort level. Uh, having a sponsor who's done a historic deal before is always nice, certainly not a requirement, um, but surrounding themselves by a general contractor, an architect, a preservation consultant that has done these things before is, is helpful. And we also talked about um, having accountants and tax credit counsel that have experience. Uh, from a construction budget perspective, we typically look have a, engage a construction consultant to take a look at the plan and review the costs and just make sure that uh, it seems doable for the budget that's out there. Uh, and then Obviously, as we've seen over the last several years with costs rising and, um, you know, things just change. So we want to make sure that we have an appropriate uh, contingencies and reserves to deal with those um, unexpected issues. We also look at guarantor financial strength. If we have a guarantor that has, uh, you know, significant net worth and liquidity, uh, that's providing a guarantee for completion, um, standing behind the ability to um, pay expenses for the project and avoid recapture. That's obviously a positive factor. I mentioned uh, briefly the, the unconditional SNDA. This is important uh, for investors to ensure that the, that the structure isn't uh, disturbed during the compliance period. So uh, in one way, shape or form, we typically look for lenders to uh, limit their remedies as it relates to the historic tax credit uh, structure. You can go to the next slide. There's also a lot of underwriting that's done. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, the environmental title, um, all that kind of due diligence. We, we do get an appraisal to see that the revenue and expenses and lease up assumptions are supported. We look at the lease up status and want to see that there's a property manager with experience in that asset type. Uh, and then we typically look for, um, you know, debt terms that, that go out through compliance and have a uh, healthy debt service coverage ratio. 
operating reserves are obviously key in case you know things don't lease up as quickly as as you thought or the rent rental rates um, aren't as high from the beginning uh, as as might have otherwise been uh, anticipated. And then we also to uh, address some of the casualty aspects, look for appropriate insurance. So those are the, some of the things that just help address the risks that an investor might be concerned about. And then you can go to the next slide one more. And as John mentioned, the, the HTC was enacted in the late 1970s, so it's been around for a long time and is a permanent credit. Uh, it has had some challenges along the way, uh, historic boardwalk and uh, the revenue procedure, what we call the safe harbor, uh, was a really hard look at how the structuring was done and really guides us now on how to structure a partnership. Uh, we also had some heartburn over 50D guidance uh, several years ago, trying to figure out how to recognize uh, some of the income that's generated by the tax credit. Uh, and so that shifted the way that uh, investors looked at the credit and the, the pricing that they were able to pay. And then obviously the Tax uh, Cuts and Jobs Act uh, nearly uh, did away with the HTC credit, but we were able to, to save it. It did shift from a one-year to a five-year and did away with the 10% credits. So you can go to the next slide and one more. Uh, so we do have, and we've been trying uh, to make some headway uh, with Congress to make some changes to the HTC to make it uh, more attractive and, and have investors be able to pay a little bit more so that it uh, contributes to the capital stack even more than it already does. So uh, the HTC Go is a, a piece of legislation that is uh, out there now uh, that temporarily increases the HTC from 20 to 30 uh, percent to address some of the challenges that we've been seeing uh, with increased, uh, you know, loan uh, terms, uh, interest rates, and also uh, just the material uh, costs as well. And then some of the permanent enhancements that uh, we're advocating for is to uh, make this credit even more valuable to small projects by increasing the credit from 20% to 30%, uh, lowering the substantial rehab test um, so that you have to put uh, less, in, less into it uh, than is otherwise required uh, in order to qualify. Uh, eliminate the basis adjustment requirement uh, to make it a little bit more uh, attractive to investors and simplify some of the tax rules for the nonprofits so that makes it easier for nonprofits to uh, take some of these beautiful historic buildings and repurpose them. And I think the last slide is just uh, giving you some information about uh, how to how to help with these advocacy efforts. We think there might be a busy lame duck session coming up here. Um, so if you've got projects or an interest in the historic tax credit, please uh, talk to your representatives, uh, see if you can get them to sign on uh, to this legislation so that we can uh, have an even more valuable credit than we have now. Great, thanks, Heather. Um, put up the new slides. Great. Um, so I am, John and Heather walked you through sort of the developer's perspective and the investor's perspective on how a development project comes together. And I am going to dive into the weeds on the technical side of the historic tax credit. Uh, so I'm Elizabeth Rosen. I am the principal at Rosen Preservation. We are historic tax credit consultants um, and work with um, developers, building owners um, across the country to help them secure both the National Register designation and the uh, federal and state historic tax credits. Since uh, 2006, we have secured historic tax credits to support about $3 billion of investment in um, redevelopment activity. Um, so I, th I think John and, and Heather especially have already alluded to the, the basic criteria for a historic tax credit project. I'm gonna run through them again with a slightly different bent to them. Um, 
So the first is that you have to have an income producing property. As Heather said, this can be any type of use other than an owner occupied residence. Um, it can be residential um, apartments, for rent apartments, commercial office, retail, manufacturing, institutional use, as long as there is an occupant paying, paying rent to the owner of the building. Next slide, please. The, the developer needs to make a substantial investment in their rehabilitation. Um, so you must spend an amount that is more than 100% of your adjusted basis. We want to get down to what is the value of the building. So if you've just purchased a property, it would be your purchase price and taking away the value of the land to calculate that adjustment. For a while, you may need to factor in the value of improvements you've previously made, and you can also subtract the depreciation. Next slide. The value, uh, the amount of your substantial investment is measured in your QRE, your qualified rehab expenses. And, and both Heather and John touched on this a little bit. Um, a lot of the costs related to a development will be considered QRE. It includes all of your depreciable hard costs as well as your allocated soft costs. Next slide, please. One easy way to think about this is to is to look at the expenses that are um, non-qualified, and these generally include your your acquisition, um, any type of expansion of the building footprint or mass, site improvements, including landscaping, parking areas, or even new construction that's um, part of the development project. Um, personal property, um, things like appliances, furniture, things that are easily swapped out, um, as well as costs related to your marketing lease up and things that this also includes um, signage. So next slide, please. Um, as, uh, well, I think both Heather and Don talked about, um, a project must involve a certified historic structure. And this is a building that's listed in the National Register of Historic Places, either as an individual landmark or as a contributing resource to a historic district. In the aerial photo, uh, you see a boundary for a National Register district all of the buildings that are contributing to that district, like those you see in the photo, would be eligible to use the historic tax credit. The National Register program predates the historic tax credit, and it has a completely separate process and timeline for designating buildings. So when the historic tax credit was created, the National Park Service recognized that this um, six to 12 month time frame for listing a building on the National Register was not compatible with the development process. And they designed the application in a way so that the developer can get um, assurance that their building will qualify for the National Register and can proceed with their rehabilitation while that nomination is um, uh, being reviewed, going through its review. The upshot here is your building does not have to be on the National Register at the time that you apply, but you want to make sure that you know that it will qualify, that it's National Register eligible. It needs to be a certified historic rehabilitation. And this means that the work, the rehabilitation itself, meets the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation. Next slide, please. The standards help us preserve a building's historic character while still allowing for it to be adapted for a new use. Um, the whole goal of this program is to help uh, buildings remain economically viable. So the standards apply to all buildings, um, all building types, regardless of their age or their function or their materials. 
they cover work to both the exterior and interior of the building as well as the site. A tax credit project must meet all 10 of the standards. So you can't choose which standards you want to meet or which part of your rehabilitation um, will get the tax credits. It's an all or nothing proposition. To discuss the standards, we can condense them into three general categories. So first, it's critical to recognize which historic elements building retains and to incorporate these into the rehabilitation plan. The treatments that you see in these two images are vastly different, yet each is appropriate for its context. On the right, we have um, what was a historic department store, which meant that the decorative plaster needed to be repaired and new elements needed to be incorporated in a way that respected the, the historic finished appearance. By contrast, the um, functional character of the warehouse building on the left was conducive to um, leaving brick exposed and incorporating very utilitarian uh, ductwork and things like that. Next slide, please. please. Elements will help you to retain the historic character in the new program. This project converted an old school into apartments, and the gym was an important space that helped to communicate the history of the building. So the architect designed uh, the apartment units in this space with a lofted plan so that they would incorporate the full volume of the historic gymnasium um, and also included the glazed tile walls and the painted wood floor into the design. Next slide, please. Sometimes a new use requires an uh, additional square footage and an addition is allowed if it complements the historic building. So the layout and size of this building were so tight they could not accommodate a, um, a new elevator and an exit stair. So an external tower was added to provide the, the vertical circulation. You can see that the new element is set back from the, the street face of the historic building. Um, it uses similar materials, but it, it definitely remains secondary to the original design. Next slide. Another important concept when thinking about the secretary standards is hierarchy of review. So are we talking about street, street facing facades or are we looking at a rear elevation that fronts on an alley? Next slide. And on the interior, again, is it these public spaces like lobbies or corridors or more private spaces, perhaps old offices or um, apartments? Next slide. If this project really focused on restoring the features that had been lost on the street facing elevation and on the, the public corridors inside and then the, the more private spaces, um, there was more leeway for, for changes to create new apartment units. Next, please. Because every building is unique in its architecture, its history, its current condition, um, the context for the redevelopment, we have to consider its history and circumstances to determine what is an appropriate rehab, what's an appropriate way to apply the standards. What may be appropriate for one project may not be appropriate for another. And, and that rule can even apply to different spaces within a single building. At this project, the um, very traditional wood paneled um, boardroom looked very different from the rest of the clean, modern 1950s office building. 
Um, and the developer really wanted all of their apartment units to have the same feel to them. But we were required to keep the that paneling from the boardroom. It was an important part of that building. Um, and ironically, um, that was the first apartment to lease up. So I think there's a lesson in there. Next slide, please. The standards give a developer a lot to think about, um, but fortunately, the National Park Service website features an array of technical guidance. Um, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. If you encounter a situation or a question, chances are somebody has encountered it before and figured out a solution. So you want to um, talk with your historic consultant, your architect, your SHPO staff um, to help figure out what will be a workable approach for your project. So I want to take a deeper look at a couple of topics that we um, encounter frequently with the standards. Next slide. Um, the first is windows. And windows are always the most complex and most expensive um, part of a rehabilitation project. That shouldn't dissuade you from taking on a project. Just be aware of that going in. And the NPS website has a trove of information that can help you figure out how to evaluate the windows in your building, whether it is to repair them or to replace them. Um, repair is always the preferred option with the cost for repairing the sash and making energy upgrades often comparable to new windows. When the existing windows are deteriorated beyond repair or not original, you can install new windows that match the configuration and dimensions and profiles of the original windows. Um, but what my one note of caution is always, always, always make sure your new windows are approved before moving forward. Next slide, please. Auditoriums, gymnasiums, church, church sanctuaries, theaters. These types of large interior rooms can be a project. They were often critical spaces that defined the historic character of their building and subdividing them will compromise the historic character. At this project, much of the old school auditorium um, was preserved as a community meeting space. But we've also seen projects where a section of the auditorium is um, uh, subdivided off to create a, a separate use, or the area behind the proscenium, the backstage area, is subdivided again for a, a separate use. This is another topic where MPS offers um, a lot of guidance online that shows how other projects have grappled with the question and incorporated these spaces into their rehab project. Next slide, please. The proper handling of, um, have, and again, and yes, has a lot of guidance on topics like lead paint abatement, um, dealing with asbestos containing materials. Um, but keep in mind that some of these materials may be considered historic fabric. We recently worked on a project that had original historic asbestos shingle siding. Um, and after evaluating the siding, we determined that most of it was in good condition. It wasn't, um, most of it was, was solid, it wasn't friable, it wasn't creating a hazard, and the um, shingles were retained. Um, we found a product that matched in terms of their dimensions, the size of the reveal, and the texture um, to replace broken shingles or missing areas, and um, the buildings were painted to give them a uniform look. Next slide, please. We, we all know that a rehabilitated building is inherently green, and historic tax credit projects are frequently recognized by LEED and other programs that encourage sustainability. 
MPS has produced a number of publications on the topic, specifically as it relates to historic tax credit projects. So for instance, we're seeing a lot of projects these days that are installing solar or rare electric usage. Um, it's, it's something that's very compatible with um, many historic tax credit projects. Next slide, please. Okay, so that was a really quick overview of the standards. We, we could have done this whole session just about the standards, but but there's a lot more to cover. So the big question now is how do I get these credits? And um, John alluded to this a little bit earlier. Um, our historic tax credit application has three parts. Uh, the first part is documents that your building is a certified historic building. So it's either in um, on the National Register already or it is National Register eligible. Uh, this is the application that you will file, again, if your building is not already on the National Register, that gives you, your lenders, and your investors the confidence to move forward before that National Register designation is uh, fully in place. Your part two application is, is the meat. This is the scope of work. Um, this is where you outline the existing conditions of the building and you detail the work that's going to be proposed. Um, all of that information is keyed to photographs of the building's existing conditions and your architectural plans. This lets the reviewers determine that your project does indeed meet the standards. And a part, an approved part two is usually required by an investor before they're willing to move forward with a project. Quite frequently, a scope of work will change during construction or new information will be discovered. If that's the case, uh, you file an amendment that outlines those changes. Um, it's a very straightforward process. And then when construction is complete, you're gonna file part three. So there's a set of photos that document a building that is submitted with your part one or your part two. And then at the end of construction, you have your after photos that shows the, the beautiful rehabilitated building that um, has come after construction. You file that with your, um, uh, with your QRE, um, and it's at that point that you're eligible to claim the credit. Next slide, please. So there's a standard IRS form that, that is used to claim the credit. The amount of the credit is calculated on the IRS form, and again, it's 20% of your qualified expenses. And, and that amount that you calculate will be deducted from the bottom line of your taxes owed. Um, as Heather said, the federal credit is paid out over five years in equal installments. And um, the, um, the credits can be used beginning the year the building is placed in service and carried forward for up to 20 years. Um, iterated again that the credits are subject to recapture if there is a change in ownership or non-compliant alterations are made within 60 months after your part three is approved. Um, so that is a really quick overview of the historic tax credit application and that process. Um, and that is, I think, my last slide. So we're ready to move into the Q&A. Um, I know one question that had come up in the chat um, or, or that we maybe hadn't touched on was about inflation and supply chain. Um, John, you probably have a lot of information about this. I know we, we have a client right now that we're working with who's experiencing um, 35% a cost coming in 35% over their estimated budget. And so there's a lot of uh, value engineering going on right now. What, what are you experiencing? Right. Uh, right. A lot of value engineering. I mean, the, the, there are labor shortages that we've never seen trades um, revamped to where they say we're as in six levels. And so that's what, you know, was, 
covered heavily in our uh, state housing conference last week. What we're seeing is supply chain issues. If we have molding projects, say like in a multifamily uh, development, we can't get the switch gear right now. And so we have projects that are opening in October that we won't have the switch gear until next April. So our contractors are running around and, you know, finding the uh, the materials that we need to do a single meter for multiple units. And then we'll have to, you know, move residents around. We do finally have that switch gear. So a lot of the components that are coming from overseeing delays in that. Um, so, you know, and then of course, you know, whenever we're in a project, bank financing is a, is a large component of the straight swings. Uh, we have to go back and find alternative sources of dollars. So whether that be ARPA funding at a, at a local level, um, it's been challenging. So. I bet. Is inflation and interest rates affecting things? Is, does that affect your end of the the deals or is that back to John? Yeah, are you having projects stall, Heather? So. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the issue is that when projects stall uh, because, you know, in, inflation and costs have increased and they're trying to find additional financing, then the interest rates are going up. So that's changing their debt service coverage ratio and, you know, the reserves they need for interest during construction. So, you know, it all sort of exacerbates one another uh, with, with both both issues creating concern. So, uh, you know, it if you can get a fixed rate and you can close quickly, it seems like <laughs> those are the those are the key issues. But that's just it's not uh, it's not always possible. So just realizing that uh, having to you know build a little bit of flexibility into the budget is important. I guess one thing that's good with the historic, the federal credit at least, is that it's rolling. That it's you're you're not locked into an amount that you estimate at the beginning of your project. If you end up spending more, you'll get more credit. Um, and I know for some state credits, they they roll the same way. And for some, it becomes a real a real burden when um, costs. Right, right. Yeah, and that's it's helpful. That's a program. Yeah. Now, I was to say that with the state credits uh, and the federal credits, at least when your costs are going up, you're getting some of that money back, whether it's 20% on the federal side or, you know, 40% when you add in the state or some of those states even have higher percentages. So not it's not 100% bad because you're getting some tax credit back for it uh, or equity back for it, but uh, uh, you know, still struggle. You know, it's the first time that I've ever even heard of uh, 45 and 50 year loans that are amortized. I don't know if you've seen that at all, Heather, on any of your deals. Um, Watch the Fortress Project. We used a HUD 221D4 that's 40 year financing. That was uh, like such a great program in regards to being able to borrow, but to actually put amortization out 45 years. Um, that's the first, and deals are still, you know, seem to be struggling with that now, now you know, becoming available. So, another question that came up was, you know, about doing uh, mixed use developments where you'll have his buildings and say, like a new facility um, or new construction. Have you seen any kind of campus type of developments or multiple? you know, building developments where you also construction um, as a large component um, of brick campus, you know, multiple phase building. We, we've definitely seen projects, um, you know, and, and they don't have to be a, a huge campus, but I there are a lot of um, affordable housing projects that involve a historic school building that will also have new construction in conjunction with it that's pretty common. Yeah, same thing. It, you, you see new construction um, is, is not all not all, not all that uncommon. It's just to keep in mind that, you know, which pieces are eligible for the credit and which aren't, uh, just making sure that you keep your financing straight. But 
that's certainly uh, an option is to you know rehab a, a building and and add on some construction as well. Yeah, generally some excess land, say like in a you know a historic site or parcel, we might do construction uh, even then help further subsidize the historic rehabilitation. We also see um, that Veterans Home Project was a good example of this, of that functionally related complex where you have multiple historic buildings um, that get redeveloped either in phases or um, in, in a single lump that provide a lot of opportunity. No, I mean, in regards to, you know, what you be careful if you have multiple things that one of your buildings doesn't jeopardize the part three, right. you know, of, of your other buildings, your investor is comfortable with the phasing if you don't do it all at one time. Uh, and so I know that the Park Service has had, you know, numerous sessions on, you know, how to do, you know, functionally related cases and, and large masters like that that we've participated in so there's always a lot of planning that goes up front definitely i also saw a question in the the chat about discussing the timeline of things uh, it's always trying to figure out sort of who you engage when and obviously you know the idea for the project comes first but then trying to figure out your financing so if you think that you have a historic building and you think the historic tax credits are an option, um, definitely working with your SHPO and a, a preservation consultant is a, is a good place to start uh, from that perspective. Right, try to keep your pre developments down and extensions on um, you know, uh, options for sites available um, as it's gonna take some time to sometimes you know, catch up and figure out um, how to make these projects come to fruition. Right, it, it's definitely a chicken and egg game. You need to have your historic process far enough along, um, but still keep keeping the other pieces in play. Let's see, a question is, can you can you be partially owner occupied? Can the owner maintain some offices? You know, let's say if it's a nonprofit tenant, the uh, nonprofit can maintain 50% of the space um, in an owner-occupied position. Um, in regards to, you know, a for-profit, you know, it's got to be still commercial income. Um, do you want to touch on that a little bit, Heather? Yeah, I was just looking at the question. Yes, yeah, so certainly you can maintain some of your space, but like you said, you have to be, if you're a nonprofit, you have to be wary of, of what percentage of the space that the nonprofit is. Uh, we've also seen projects where we call them in-place rehab. So if you've got some, some great tenants that you don't want to displace, uh, you don't have to have an empty building. Uh, but certainly easier from a security and development construction perspective, uh, but the rules allow for in-place rehabs. Uh, there are some restrictions from a uh, from historic tax credit compliance perspective, just from a structuring perspective with um, the sponsor having a, a, a lease of the space, but uh, a lot of times the lenders will require that anyways because they want the space leased up, so it becomes a non-issue, but uh, that's certainly uh, an option. I think one important note in the whole nonprofit question is if you're rehabbing a building <clears throat> that your nonprofit is not currently a tenant in, <clears throat> excuse me, and they they just become a tenant in a in a in a space paying rent, that there are no limitations on that. The 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 difficulty comes when the the nonprofit is also part of the the ownership, the building ownership, and the development team. Yeah, you'll hear. Or they've of, been in the building for before. Prior use. Yep. Yeah, that prior use is like a, a bad word sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> it comes to nonprofit because if you own the building but you want to you know rehab it and put some money into it, it makes it much more difficult to structure if you want to continue to uh, 
use the space uh, on the back end. We've certainly found ways to do it uh, in, in many situations, particularly, uh, you know, John mentioned theaters. A lot of times the, they'll own the theater to begin with and they want to maintain it as a theater and operate it. Um, so sometimes you just have to make sure that you structure the, uh, you know, the operating agreement and the pro management agreement uh, appropriately to avoid some issues. What, one of the next questions was, it was how, I, how- I think this is a question that's kind of dis disqualified Sorry, disqualified leases are kind of like the standards, like interpreting the standards. There's a lot that's been done before. And if you have that kind of a situation, just find somebody who's been through the process to help you out. Absolutely. And there was a question about how the pandemic has affected, you know, credit pricing. Um, the, the three credits that I would get called quite a bit about was, you know, theaters, the pandemic. There, there was a theater project I was involved with that closed one week before um, March of 2020. Um, so, you know, the projects where you had, you know, the communal use, that struggled. Then hotels. I don't know, Heather, if, have you seen hotel investments at all? I come back. Um, a lot of those folks seem to be, you know, in a challenging position. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, certainly the pandemic has affected appetite, but I think it's more affected the types of projects that folks are willing to do. Uh, as you see, you know, obviously uh, residential projects seem to do okay, but theaters and hotels, I mean that those when you've got a when you've got an investor in there and you know a sponsor for that matter who want to see the project succeed and get cash flow, it's hard to it's hard to get back in. We are seeing hotel uh, projects come back, uh, mostly because it's going to take, you know, 18 to 24 months to get them built. Uh, and then mostly, uh, you know, the most attractive ones are the ones that are in uh, sort of destination uh, cities. Yeah. Uh, so you're certainly starting to see them come back, uh, but, it, you know, it, it's it's slow. We, we definitely had a couple of um, hotel projects that switched to um, yeah. multifamily. And you know the projects I know that I've seen, uh, the investors are still waiting for payment uh, for a stabilization payment coming in. Yeah. You know, it's really hovering and you know working through this. Yeah. All right. Any any other Rhonda and team backstage? Anything else? <laughs> People in the audience, anything else? All right, I think I think that we're done with questions. Great, that was wonderful. Thank you to John and Heather and Elizabeth for sharing your expertise. I know this is a topic that many people could talk about all afternoon, and we really appreciate um, you sharing your your time and expertise with us. Um, for those in the audience, the recording will be available following the Pass Forward Conference. At this time, presentations are not available. Um, we'd also like to ask you to join us for our next workshop, which is being held at um, 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern on October 18th on the topic of issues in preservation law and also to be on the lookout for more on-demand content coming in October. So with that, um, I'll sign off for now. And thanks again to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.